Africa. Unknown gunmen kill over 100 people in an attack on a village in western Ethiopia. Violence surges in Bangui in the Central African Republic ahead of the presidential elections come December 27th. Thus, Spanish Coast Guard rescues 49 African migrants near Gran Canaria. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Layo Adegoke. We begin today in the Horn of Africa where over 100 people have been killed by unknown attackers in a village in western Ethiopia. Wednesday's attack in the Beni Shangu Guzum region comes one day after a visit by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. In a statement, the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission said the attack took place in the village of Bekoji, which lies in an area home to multiple ethnic groups. Beyene Mesele, a spokesperson for the state government, blames what he called an anti-peace element for the attack. Well, let's get more on this story from a freelance reporter in Ethiopia. Simon Max joins us now from Addis Ababa. Thank you so much. Simon, for speaking to us, what more can you tell us about the attack in Beni Shangu Guzum region? Yes, so as you say, this attack killed more than 100 people, and it came very, very shortly after a visit to the area by the Prime Minister. I think it's just important to note that the attack came shortly after federal troops actually pulled out of this specific area. Um, the government, I don't think, have said where those troops went, but obviously, clearly, with the dispute in the north of Ethiopia, in the Tigray region, there are, we're beginning to see various power voids uh, all around the country, which is leading to more instability in areas where there have been long-standing um, long disputes between different ethnic groups. The government and the Human Rights Commission, they've been very careful not to state who, who carried out the attack. There is some doubt around that, although sources who I've spoken to did confirm that it's believed to be um, militiamen belonging to the Gumuz ethnic group. And uh, there's been long-standing tensions between Gumuz people uh, and Amharas uh, specifically living in that area. Now, with this crisis in Tigray and now this attack in the, that region, it seems Ethiopia has, you know, its plate full at the moment. Well, how are authorities now handling the issue of, you know, the people displaced by this crisis? Well, in the Tigray region, there is believed to be up to a million people displaced due to the conflict there. Obviously, that comes on top of many, many more uh, already internally displaced people in the Somali region due to conflict, climate issues uh, in Oromia um, and, and, and other parts of Ethiopia. So the government, they do have funds uh, available to try and you know, uh, provide services, uh, food, non-food items to displaced people. But at the moment, it's been very slow to get out. It's only been targeted in areas that the government controls in the Tigray region, which so far amounts to a, a few towns in the West. Um, so honestly, the, the international community is extremely worried that there's just hundreds of thousands of people who once had access to cash, banks, um, to buy their food, who, who no longer do. And uh, there's a huge question mark over the safety of, of a massive number of people. Mm, it, it, it is indeed an unfortunate situation, but we'd like to thank you, Simon Marx. Uh, thank you for joining us on Network Africa. Thanks. Meanwhile, the United Nations says despite limited access to conflict areas, assistance has started to gradually trickle into Ethiopia's Tigray region. 
On Wednesday, UN spokesperson Stefan Dujaric says that the World Health Organization dispatched emergency health supplies to treat more than 10,000 patients for three months and additional medical supplies are on the way. Just an update from Ethiopia where we're being told by our humanitarian colleagues that although access is limited in areas where conflict is ongoing, humanitarian assistance has started to gradually trickle in to Tigray province. The World Health Organization has dis dispatched emergency health supplies to treat more than 10,000 patients for three months. Additional medical supplies are on the way. The World Food Program managed to deliver food for 35,000 refugees in Adi Harush and Maj Ayani camps this week, but the convoy to Histats and Shimelba refugee camps have returned due to insecurity in the area. Water treatment uh, chemicals were also provided to internally displaced people in northern Amhara as well as western Tigray. Water, sanitation, hygiene, and non-food items are also pre-positioned in northern Amhara and western Afar for 5,000 internally displaced people. And our colleagues uh, at OCHA also, together with the logistics cluster for the UN led by the World Food Program, agreed uh, with the relevant authorities on setting up temporary humanitarian information sharing mechanisms. Um, Move on to politics. Now, the UN mission in the Central African Republic, MINUSCA, has denied reports that the UPC armed group has taken control over the town of Bambari. Now, the UN mission says that the UN peacekeepers are patrolling the streets and the situation is under control even as the country approaches its election day, December 27th. Colleagues at the UN peacekeeping mission there today denied press reports that were claiming that Bambari, the town of Bambari had fallen and remained under the control of the UPC armed group. The UN mission says that UN peacekeepers are patrolling the streets and that the situation is under control. MINUSCA, the peacekeeping mission, launched operations yesterday to expel the UPC combatants and retook full control of the town following an attack by combatants against the uh, Central African Gendarmerie forces. And also in a statement issued today, the Central African Republic's country-specific configuration of the Peacebuilding Commission issued a statement strongly condemning the recent attacks on civilians, peacekeepers, and humanitarian workers, as well as violations of the political agreement. And the UN Human Rights Office also today said they were deeply alarmed by the reports of escalating violence in the CAR just days ahead of the election. The violence stoked by political grievances and hate speech have resulted in the forced displacement of civilians, including uh, neighbor, uh, neighboring countries. In the meantime, instability is escalating ahead of polls on Sunday in the Central African Republic. UN peacekeepers are battling rebels, even as the president, Faustin Ashange Toadera, is accusing his rival of plotting a coup, and Russia and Rwanda have sent in military support. Panic has gripped the streets of the capital, Bangui, with businesses closing and people holing up in their homes as the country braces up for December 27th. Bongosu may appear calm today, but the town's recent history is written on bullet-scarred buildings and on streets littered with rubble. With an election on Sunday, there are fears that a new chapter in Central African Republic's history of ethnic and religious violence is about to be written. Security forces and UN peacekeepers are in battle with rebels who have seized towns and roads and are threatening the capital, Bongi, and world powers have also been drawn into the conflict. In Bongasu, Ismail Diki knows the cost of such violence. All that we went through, it was really difficult. We can't speak of good things. We lost our parents, our belongings, our homes. In some of the worst bloodshed, Mostly Christian and animist militia, known as the anti balaka attacked Bongosu in May 2017. During a three-day siege, they assaulted the town's Muslims who sought refuge in the mosque. The Muslims were held hostage on the heavy gunfire until the intervention of UN peacekeepers. 
Walking around the ruins of what was once the mosque, Dickey pointed to heaps of rubble where women of the town used to pray. The men's section was also destroyed. As you can see, the mosque is destroyed. So really the consequence of the said war is very difficult. For another resident, Ali Idris, the insecurity is worrying. We are not safe because we know our executioners from yesterday are still strong. They are here in the neighborhood. They brag. They still destroy the homes we build. It's scary. Despite several peace deals between war and militias, the election of President Faustin to Adera in 2015 and the presence of 12,800 uninformed UN peacekeepers, Central African Republic has failed to stabilize. As election day approaches, some opposition parties have called for the election to be postponed, but that's been rejected by the government and the United Nations, which has placed its troops in the capital and other regions on high alert and vowed to protect civilians and secure the vote. Let's now go back to one of our main stories for today, the attack in Ethiopia that killed over 100 people. We have joining us now Achike Chudo, uh, Chude, African Affairs Analyst. Thank you so much for speaking to us on the program. Now, what do you make of this latest development? Ethiopia is still struggling to cope with the fallout of you know, the Tigrayan crisis. And now this deadly violence in the Beni Shango Guzum region. What do you make of all of it? Well, I think it's um, another day in Ethiopia. Um, you might not know that uh, Ethiopia for a very long time has been in all kinds of uh, violent crises. Uh, in the decades past, Ethiopia has fought five wars, two of them against Eritrea, one which lasted for about 30 years, one against Somalia over the Ogaden region, and then two civil wars. And then, like you said, about six weeks ago, the attack, uh, you know, the... Uh, the seizure of uh, federal troops, and then the, uh, the, uh, the trouble with uh, you know, the Tigray region of Ethiopia. Right now, uh, there's also a security threat along, you know, by Islamist uh, militants along uh, the eastern border of, uh, of uh, Ethiopia. And so there are all kinds of uh, conflicts, and uh, this is uh, one uh, latest um, act of violence that um, is uh, completely unwholesome and uh, that must be condemned. But it is an but, uh, Ethiopia is not uh, getting it right in terms of uh, governance. Uh, of course, there are all kinds of issues: the um, land, you know, uh, uh, you know and uh, and there are other issues. Uh, obviously, the government at the center is uh, being hard put to try to handle some of uh, this uh, crisis. Um, and so it's it's really it's really bothersome. It's really in a worrisome development, it just clearly shows that uh, things are getting out of hand and the, the central government, Ethiopia, is not uh, able to, uh, you know, handle this crisis. And so when you look at the pocket of uh, violence in many parts of Ethiopia at uh, the same time, people are being worried, are worried that uh, the Ethiopian uh, troops, that uh, the military is stretching itself thin, having to go to different places at the same time to try now, this attack in Beni Shangu Guzum region, this attack comes just one day after the Prime Minister visited that area. Could this attack perhaps signal the beginning of an attempt to revolt against Prime Minister Abiy's government? No, I, I do not think it has to do with uh, Prime Minister Abiy's government. Uh, it's about the instability, general instability that has characterized uh, Ethiopia for so many decades right now. And so uh, it really has nothing to do with the coloration of uh, the person that is uh, on board. Uh, the reality, like I was trying to say, is that um, Ethiopia is made up of about um, 80 different you know, ethnic groups. Uh, not uh, a few days ago, after this uh, recent uh, attack, uh, Prime Minister Abiy went on Twitter and there was tweeting that um, some people are trying to divide Ethiopia along religious and uh, ethnic uh, lines. And so they are natural fault lines you know, ethnicity and religion are playing a part. And obviously people are trying to take, you know, adv advantage of, of that. Uh, this has been the lot of Ethiopia for a very, very long time. And uh, I think it is something 
that uh, the political elites who have refused to actually build Ethiopia along you know, strictly federal lines to allow the various units of Ethiopia to participate in national life and national development, it is high time that they begin to do that. So it is the perennial problem that has characterized Ethiopia uh, for so many decades and not essentially something that is against uh, you know, Abe. And you know, the funny thing about, uh, or the strange thing about uh, Abe, you know, being a, a prime minister of Ethiopia, is that uh, he, this is the first time somebody in 2018, when he came to power, the very first time that somebody from the majority tribe that constitutes more than half of the population of Ethiopia, you know, has been allowed to come to power. Uh, you know, and so, uh, but it is something that uh, Ethiopians really need to sit down. The political leadership, the elites need to sit down to ask themselves how they can actually begin to build, uh, you know, a, a nation that is for all much uh, mr ashike chudu african african affairs analyst thank you for your thoughts on our program a pleasure welcome back to the program the spanish coast guards have transported 49 african migrants who were rescued in the atlantic ocean to aginagi port in the island of grand canaria Interior Ministry figures show more than 21,400 migrants have arrived in Gran Canaria by sea this month. That is an eight-fold increase compared to the same time last year. The large hike in irregular arrivals poses a logistical challenge for the authorities in the Canary Islands who have had to find alternative reception centers as existing centers are filled up. Arrivals of migrants in the Canary Islands has increased in 2020 as they look for alternative routes due to increased patrolling off the Mediterranean coast of southern Spain. Now, the United Kingdom has banned travelers from South Africa from coming into the country amid concern over a variant of COVID-19 linked to the African country. People who have been in or transited through South Africa in the last 10 days will not be allowed into the UK. However, the new rule will not apply to British and Irish nationals, but they will also have to self-isolate. This new variant is highly concerning because it is yet more transmissible and it appears to have mutated further than the new variant that has been discovered in the UK. We've taken the following action. First, we are quarantining cases and close contacts of cases found here in the UK. Second, we're placing immediate restrictions on travel from South Africa. And finally, and most importantly, Anyone in the UK who has been in South Africa in the past fortnight and anyone who is a close contact of someone who's been in South Africa in the last fortnight must quarantine immediately. Tunisia's health ministry says the country will extend its nightly curfew until mid-January. Now, this decision follows the recommendation of the country's COVID-19 scientific committee. More than 120,000 positive cases have been recorded since March, but the majority of infections are said to be from recent months. The health ministry says the new strain of the virus has not been recorded in Tunisia, and the country plans to roll out vaccines in the month of April. Official figures show that the death rate is at an average of more than 40 per day, even as 77% of ICU beds across the country are now occupied. Well, in Kenya, a tattoo artist is putting smiles on the faces of his clients with his creative and well-thought-out designs. Let's take a look. Welcome to the Bari Arts Tattoo Studio in Nairobi, Kenya. Barrington Body Tuska Kangwana, its owner, has been inking and piercing bodies for dozens of years. He says it's sought after because of a signature style. Tattooing is like someone's signature. So, like, let's say like someone's handwriting. So some people get interested, like uh, they like someone's handwriting more than yeah, so maybe like with my different form of art, I, 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 I just uh, had this passion of making it a bit different in a way that I can't explain, in a way that many people got interested in knowing 
how Barry is doing, how Barry Tasker is doing the ad. It's also clear that hygiene is a key element of operations here. I've known him for such a long period of time. Uh, hygiene wise, yeah, like needles, for example. When you do it like uh, in a random place, you don't know where people get their things or stuff like that. But for like his things, even before you get the tattoos, it normally shows you uh, where they are new, he opens it and yeah, things like that. Even the urban youths across Africa are starting to create alternative opportunities to the formal employment options their parents built their careers on. Some say the push to choose the path of engineering, medicine or law is no longer strong. So normally uh, we move around, been to Thailand, been to Nigeria, been to States, been to UK, just because of the tattooing, been to South Africa, been to different countries. Uh, normally we get bookings and then we accumulate a number of people and then uh, they, they cater, some of them cater for the flight and accommodation and everything. Yeah. We're going to tattoo them. Barry Tuska is a pioneer, though. He stopped pursuing a degree in architecture in 2008 and says he now has a massive repertoire of tens of thousands of tattoos to show for it. Well, just before we end the program back here in Nigeria, following weeks of herdsmen attacks in Benue State, one of the Middle Belt states in Nigeria, stakeholders are calling for the inauguration of a community policing squad to help track and tackle issues of insecurity across the state. On the 12th of December, residents of Makadi, the Benue State capital, woke up to news of an attack by a suspected herdsmen, which led to the death of four persons while seven others were injured. Four days later, a lawyer, Mr. Moses Udam, his pregnant wife, and an aged man were hacked to death by suspected herdsmen who are said to have now taken control of the river line boundaries of Makadi, Gua West, and Agatu local councils. As part of efforts to motivate and equip security officers in the area, the state government is presenting operational vehicles to security agencies and traditional rulers. Thank you. Thank you for we want to say thank you to the governor of Benue State for remembering our fathers. We have a situation where most of them uh, ride on our cadres, and that is not a beautiful sight at all. The governor has shown the humane part of him. He has shown that uh, he has compassion right in him. I must let the governor know that we so much appreciate all the effort he's making to make sure that uh, there is peace and security in Benue State. Although the gesture is commendable, the traditional rulers are seeking for immediate inauguration of a community police squad. We are appealing that the, the community police yet to be inaugurated, be inaugurated so that we have them in every nook and cranny of the local of the state so that we'll be able to fight insecurity. After the presentation of staff of office to the traditional rulers, Level Governor has, Tom assures you of, of inclusive approach to governance that will address both insecurity and wealth creation. The leadership of the youth in the state will meet with the state executive council early next year to work out a blueprint for the establishment of the commission. Over 100 vehicles ranging from operational hillox trucks and cars were presented to the beneficiaries to aid timely response and coordination in matters of safety and security. Thank you so much for watching Network Africa today. That's it on the program. I'm Layo Adegupi.